Hello, my name is Austin Duncan. I'm the director of the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching, but more importantly, I am a colleague of Dr. Stephen J. Lawson, and it is my deep honor today to come to you from two home offices in the midst of Dat Rona, uh, the virus that has swept the world and changed uh, so many things about the way we conduct life and ministry. Uh, and so I have this, this wonderful privilege to come to you in this strange time with uh, one of my living heroes, my colleague at the Master Seminary, the Dean of the Doctor of Ministry program, Dr. Stephen Lawson. Welcome to my living room and your office. Jonathan Edwards is sprouting out of your head. How are you, sir? You know, I'm doing much better now that I'm talking to you, ATD. I, I feel like you are. I can tell that you're doing better. I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking to you about how this has impacted your life and, and provide an opportunity for you to give some encouragement uh, to uh, the audience of pastors that were, were list that are listening in on a conversation like this, seminary students. And uh, this, this has definitely impacted everyone's life, but uh, you are a traveling man. Uh, a longtime pastor uh, turned itinerant conference speaker, evangelist, missionary. Uh, you're like Whitfield with status on an airplane. So, uh, what in the world? You just give us give us a little glimpse of what's this been like for for someone who travels a million miles a year on an airplane, and that's all come to a screeching halt. How's this impacted your ministry? Well, uh, it's, I've come to a screeching halt uh, as far as my normal schedule. Um, last year, I did 155,000 miles. The uh, year before that, I did 165,000 miles. So that, that's just a lot of miles to fly. And I had the entire year booked. And when this went down... Um, we had to cancel the next six months of plane tickets, which included one around the world plane ticket. You can actually buy an around the world ticket. And I was flying to Jakarta, Indonesia, and then to Rome, um, and then back to the States. So that's canceled. I was going to New Zealand, that was canceled. I was coming there to do the Puritan Conference. That was canceled. I was leading 50 people through Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, that was canceled. Uh, uh, the Ligonier Conference was canceled. The, my institutes for expository preaching uh, have been temporarily canceled. Uh, there's supposed to be one in Canada here shortly, but I'm sure that's going to be canceled. So everything has been canceled. However, uh, God has worked it for great good in that um, I actually needed to write a book on John Wycliffe. And so this has put me in my study in my home, and I have been working nonstop the last three weeks on writing a biography of John Wycliffe. And so that this is really the, the grace of God to provide me this parentheses and time to do this. And I've also started a daily live stream uh, Bible study. And right now I'm going through Psalm 46. And that, interestingly enough, is reaching a lot of people around the world. And so I'm preaching every morning on live stream. And I'm still doing my men's Bible study on Thursday mornings, which is um, going through Romans. I'm in Romans 1136, and I'm preaching at Trinity Bible Church uh, of Dallas on Sunday mornings. So I'm literally preaching every day of the week, still just on live stream, and then spending the rest of my time writing books and uh, working on other writing projects to keep everything moving forward. So uh, only because you asked me, um, but it's, it's allowed me to be home and to go on walks with my wife every evening and uh, to 
watch the Trump press conferences. So this is this that's uh, that's helpful. That's what we needed to hear. We needed to hear what is happening with the traveling man. How how can he who lives to preach and uh, goes anywhere to preach the gospel and to talk about the sovereignty of God and the glory of preaching. Uh, what does he do in the time of, of uh, quarantine? And so the answer is he just keeps preaching. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I thought you'd just be in your front yard yelling at the neighbors maybe to repent because the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. But you've, you've found an audience thanks to technology. Uh, who knew? Who knew, Lawson, that you would be a flat screen preacher? <laughs> well, uh, uh, it's it's just an open door at the moment. Yeah, and we're all looking forward to having you back in the wild. Uh, the Word of God is not chained by the circumstances, uh, and I think that the adaptability that you're seeing from so many pastors is uh, just evidence of that. They've increased their their shepherding care of people, and they've done everything they can to communicate God's word to them, even in this environment. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you've already been on the internet for quite some time uh, doing your men's Bible study on Thursday mornings. And if uh, someone that's listening to this hasn't heard that yet, you can find that on Facebook. You can connect with that through One Passion Ministries, Dr. Lawson's ministry, or you can find it through the ministry of Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. All that is Googleable. So uh, you're used to having things live stream, but talk a little bit about the dynamic of preaching uh, to an empty room. That's an unusual deal, and you are an energetic, passionate preacher, widely uh, known for that aspect of preaching in, in your ministry. Uh, what's it like to preach in an empty room, and, and how would you encourage the guys who are doing the same thing? Uh, not Not to a large audience or a congregation, but instead to maybe a guy and a a sound guy and someone running the camera. Yeah. Well, um, I've had guys text me and ask me, how do I do this? Because they've never done it before. And I said, rule number one is you do not look at empty seats and you do not preach to empty seats. Uh, you look into the camera and in that lens uh, are thousands of people who are watching or hundreds or dozens or whatever the scope of your ministry is. And you also look into your Bible. And I find that as I look into my Bible, um, it would be the same as if I was standing in Yankee stadium and preaching to a hundred thousand people. Uh, because as you look into your Bible and you see some notes there, you, you're in a zone. And so as I've been preaching over these last uh, weeks, um, I really have had no thought that no one's in the room. Uh, my wife will be sitting in a chair and two elders of a church will be sitting in a chair and that's it. But for me, it would be the same as if I was at Grace Community Church on a Sunday morning and there's 2,500 people in, in the worship center. So I think you become, you're just so locked in to what you're preaching and what you're saying that you lose all sense of who's there, who's not there. Uh, for me, it's, it, it's really been the same. And so I find myself gesturing. I find myself pointing at the camera lens. I find myself hitting the, the pulpit. Um, I find myself stepping back from the pulpit and looking at my notes and then stepping back into the pulpit. Um, and none of it's play acting and none of it is rehearsed. It's just what God has called us to do. And, and in reality, we preach to a congregation of one. I mean, we, we preach for, for the approval of God. And if we please God, it doesn't matter who we displease. And if we displease God, it doesn't matter who we please. And so we preach really quorum Deo, uh, as in the face of God. And God is our audience, God is our congregation, and God is our judge and jury. And we know that we are bringing pleasure to the, to the heart of God as he hears his own word expounded and hears his son uh, magnified. 
So that's just really the reality of what's going on inside of my head as, as I do that. And um, I mean, who knows, maybe I preach better <laughs> with no one in the room uh, just because I'm not being distracted uh, by people and maybe wondering, are they paying attention? What are they thinking, et cetera? I'm just more locked in on preaching for the glory of God. So that, that, that's what pops into my mind, ATD. I think that's, I think that's extremely helpful. Uh, you know, especially, especially as you think about just how that dynamic changes. And, and I love what you're saying about uh, the most important dynamic hasn't changed. God is present. His word is being expounded. Amen. So in God's providence, you've been thinking a lot about Wycliffe and those yeah. Lollards. So yeah. what, what are you learning about preaching afresh in this new study uh, that you've endeavored in your quarantine? Yeah, well, Wycliffe precedes the printing press. And so uh, the access of, of information is not as wide as with Luther and Calvin who would follow Gutenberg's printing press. However, we still nevertheless have his treatises and some of his sermons. And, you know, what really strikes me is just what a Bible man Wycliffe was. And every chapter in my book is Bible and then something. Bible defender, Bible theologian, Bible scholar, uh, Bible preacher, um, Bible um, apologist. Uh, I mean, he, he was just a Bible man. Oh, Bible translator. And then the last chapter, Bible preachers, plural, sending out the Lollards. And, and so there is this inseparable connection between your commitment to the Word of God and to the preaching of the Word of God. And that's an unbroken link. And if you are committed to the authority, to the inspiration, the infallibility, the sufficiency, the exclusivity of truth, redemptive truth in the scripture, then you will preach the word of God. And if you don't, then you really do not believe what you say you believe. You, you may check the boxes on inerrancy and infallibility and sufficiency, et cetera. But if you don't preach it, um, you, you, you are really uh, a walking um, contradiction in terms. And so Wycliffe, in a day when the Pope reigned, in fact, they had two Popes <laughs> um, in his day. Um, Wycliffe, was rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And let me add this, Austin. He was the leading intellectual of England. He was the leading intellectual, perhaps, of even Europe. He was a professor at Oxford University when Oxford was the leading um, institution for higher education in all of England and rivaled the University of Paris. And he is not only a graduate um, of Oxford, having entered at age 16, but he received his, his bachelor's, he received his master's, and he received his doctorate, all from Oxford. And he was a stunningly brilliant intellect in philosophy. And just to remind us, that's what R.C. Sproul majored in in college was philosophy. And then he also was the leading intellect in theology. And so that's a powerful one-two punch. At the same time, he's, he's, he's like John MacArthur in that he, he is a, a contender for the faith. And he, he literally took on the Pope in a day when no one is taking on the Pope. And he took on the Mass. He took on the Eucharist. He took on the priesthood. Um, he, he took on the entire establishment publicly. Actually, his greatest work 
his life's work is accomplished after he is removed from his public office as the premier professor at the premier university. And he's taken off into isolation and he just begins to write these treatises, uh, the truth of scripture um, on the Eucharist, uh, on apostasy, uh, another on the Ten Commandments. He, he writes another one where he takes the Lord's Prayer and he draws 10 imperatives out of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, and he turns every one of those against Rome and shows where Rome has violated the Lord's Prayer. Even beginning with our Father who is in heaven, we're not calling the Pope Father. There's only one who is our Father, and that is God in heaven. And he, he, he is so pointed, he calls the Pope the Antichrist. This is 150 years before Luther comes onto the scene and, and picks up this, this fight. So um, Wycliffe is really the pioneer. He's really the ice cutter ship breaking up the frozen tundra for the reformers to come in behind him and pick up the loose pieces and carry it forward. In fact, at the Diet of Worms, when um, Luther stands heresy trial um, uh, in 1521, April 18th, um, he is accused of being a Wycliffeite. And Huss was accused of being a Wycliffeite at the Council of Constance in 1415. And so even Huss and Luther, who will follow Wycliffe, that's the badge that's hung on them. You're, you're a Wycliffeite. And um, Huss died, excuse me, Wycliffe died in 1384. And you can help me do the math on this. In 1415 at the Council of Constance, they condemn Wycliffe and, and have his books, all of his books burned. And, and you know, this, this is like, you know, uh, 30 some odd years after he has died. Doc, and is, this then, when they, is this when they dug him up and, th and burned him again? That, well, that's even later. That's okay, even a few later. years after that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a few. I think it's like, I'm just going to make a guess here, 1432. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which is like another almost 20 years later. They can't get rid of Wycliffe. And I mean, he is stuck on the back of the wall. And the truth, though dead, he still yet preaches and speaks. And so that's when they had his body exhumed from the cemetery at the church where he pastored at uh, Lutterworth um, and had it dug up and his ashes cast into the Swift River. And as you know, the great quote, as his ashes were carried out the Swift River, they flowed out into the ocean, and the influence of Wycliffe spread to the whole world. Um, and so I, I just love Wycliffe. It, it's easy when, when you're like batting fifth in the batting order, but when you're first man up and you're like a Navy SEAL, you're the first one to hit the beach, and there's no support help. It's just you and God. And it's like John Knox said, God plus one makes a majority. And, and that's, that's what Wycliffe lived out. Now, he did have some other professors who would stand with him. And they carried on the work after he was finished, after he died. And there was a second edition to the Wycliffe Bible that they put it into a little bit more of a readable translation. Wycliffe's translation, he went after a literal translation. It was so literal that it was a little hard to read because his Bible was simply a translation of a translation. Um, you know, Erasmus had not yet gathered together the uh, Greek transcripts from the monasteries of Europe because Constantinople had, had not yet fallen. And so all Wycliffe had to work with was um, a, a, the Latin Vulgate. So he's having to translate, and he was brilliant in Latin. 
And so he, he was well prepared to translate from Latin into English. And so now is the first time in the history of the world there is an English Bible. There had been some isolated, like Psalms in a part of the Gospel of John. Someone, you know, a few people had tried to translate a few isolated parts, and it was very crude. And this is in Middle English. And so Wycliffe is even being a part of shaping what would become modern English um, by putting this into, um, uh, in, into a written form. So I don't know. I mean, you, you asked me about Wycliffe, but I, let me say this. He is the father of the English pulpit. Now just ponder that for a moment. Um, Whitfield, Spurgeon, Lloyd-Jones, English preachers really follow behind John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was the first English preacher of any note, any note in the English language. So, I mean, that speaks volumes of his strategic place in history uh, in preaching the word of God. And, you know, Austin, we have a lot of men who come out of master's seminary and who go with TMAI. And they go to parts of the world. You, know, you and I have both been to Samara, Russia. and We've been to other TMAI centers around the world. We're, we're a part of training men who in some ways are like Wycliffe in that you are the first Bible expositor in this part of the world who, who takes a Bible and opens it up and strict to the text of Scripture uh, expounds the, the doctrine and the theology and the truth of a passage of Scripture. So I, I've, I've talked too long without letting you ask. Oh, no, it's really good. I mean, we're, we're all just listening in on this, this uh, Wycliffe speech. I'm a little concerned about Jonathan Edwards behind you uh, getting moved off the wall and, you know, a Wycliffe <laughs> picture going up. So, well, I, sure. uh, there's, there's Tyndale. Oh, you got Tyndale there. And there's Whitfield. Yeah. There's Calvin. And then over here, up on top, is John Knox. And there's Martin Luther. Classic Luther. Yep. And there's the Prince of Preachers, Spurgeon. And then over here on this desk, there's some statues of Spurgeon and Luther and Calvin and another Luther. I don't know if you're able to see that or not. I can see and, it. And then there's my one of my mentors, R.C. Sproul. And, and there's the Queen, Queen Anne right there. So... Yeah. <laughs> it, you really need you need a little bit more wall space for your Wycliffe artwork. You know, I Love. actually I was on the internet this morning looking <laughs> for the best Wycliffe picture that I could find, and and they're all really rather inferior. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I did find kind of a uh, um, an etching uh, with his books being burned at the bottom of the portrait. And I think that's the one that's, uh, that's going to go on my wall here. So I've, I've written a biography of all seven of these men. So they're all dear to my heart. I spent one year with each of these men uh, being discipled by them as I researched for the book. So Wycliffe will be the eighth uh, biography. And, you know, each one of these leaves an imprint on you even as you preach. And I know we're talking about the MacArthur Center for Preaching and Lord knows MacArthur's fingerprints are all over my sermon notes and sermon manuscripts and his influence is, is huge. But each of these giants of the past have a part in shaping our preaching in the present. So, I mean, we walk with giants and we stand on the shoulder of these giants and there's a part of me that channels Edwards, channels Whitfield, channels Spurgeon. I mean, it, it, it's just in your DNA. I mean, it's just like an IV hookup of these men. And you stand up to preach and you have no idea what you're going to say, how you're going to say it necessarily, the way it comes out. But 
there's the echo of these men. I think we all need men like this resonating within us. It's, it's so helpful. And I think that your, your tribute to those men and your uh, submission to their discipleship is admirable and a good example for all of us to dig our roots deep into church history. Uh, and, you know, God bless you on your hunt for Wycliffe uh, paraphernalia. It's going <laughs> to, you know, I, I won't turn it around, right but I've also got the Reformation wall right here with Calvin and Knox and Farrell and B. I mean, you, you can take us on a little tour if you want. I mean, you walk, walk us through the office. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it, I, it, I've it, been in that office. It's a beautiful office. It, it is. And here, here's a little globe going around uh, as, as we speak, but there's the, uh, the Reformation wall men uh, holding up the, my Oxford English dictionary and Oxford English thesaurus. You so know I, I feel, you know how I feel about the OED. I, I get covetous at your OED. I, I know. I think it was Blaise Pascal said the chief uh, unhappiness of a man is his inability to sit in a chair. He was talking about, um, you know, being alone with your own thoughts and the reality of, of death, you know, haunting a person, but he clearly yeah. didn't have an office like yours. Um, because I think you like it in there quite a bit. I think you like oh, I, I do. I mean, here, here's the view from back over here. There's the red chair that you sat in. So. I sat in that chair. It's, I still see a little shape from me in that <laughs> chair. Lawson, it's, it's really helpful to hear you just uh, think about preaching, even in these difficult circumstances and the encouragements you're giving to, to men. It's, it's, it's enriching to listen to you uh, wax uh, eloquent on Wycliffe <laughs> and uh, the River Swift all the way out to the world. And, and I think that's, that's extremely inspirational and helpful. And it's a reminder that the, the word of God cannot be hindered. It is not in chains to Timothy 2.9. And it, it continues to advance and go forward. Uh, I talked to Dr. MacArthur about this uh, the other day and wanted to ask you the same question. Uh, you know, you and I have a particular interest in in the seminary because we uh, love those men and invest in those men. You teach in our preaching department. Uh, the majority of our preaching classes are, are instructed by you personally. Uh, and our D-Min program is uh, how you spend so many hours of your time in the classroom for the doctor of ministry. Uh, we're having even in this time of quarantine, an increased interest in men wanting to come to seminary. Uh, and so we're encouraged by that. And, and we are planning yeah. on having our demon module this July. And we're still accepting uh, men into that, that uh, fellowship. So talk about, is it a good time to come to seminary? I mean, Lord willing, we're going to have seminary starting you know, up in July. We'll, we'll be back to, to some kind of new normal. And in the fall, we're looking forward to an enrollment of, of new men at the seminary. So is it a good time to come to seminary? Are you, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, has Wycliffe inspired you to send more Bible teachers out than ever before? Uh, is that an Amen. Thing? Crank your hey, engine we're, we're talk about it. We're going to be more Lollards from the Master's Seminary. Absolutely. Um, let me just say this, Austin. There has never been a better time to go to the master's seminary than right now. And if you wait until it's an easy time to go to seminary, then we don't need you. And, and really there's never going to be an easy time. Um, the devil prowls about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He holds the whole world and under his sway. Um, evil is run, running rampant. Um, in that sense, nothing has changed. We have the dire need for gospel preachers and Bible expositors. And so there's never been a greater time to go to seminary right now than right now. And I would say it is in the midst of adversity that um, the gospel shines the brightest. Um, the Reformation was a turbulent era of controversy. Wycliffe, I don't have time to go back through Wycliffe again, but Wycliffe preached in days of great difficulty and adversity, but the light shines the brightest in the darkest hour. So if, if, I, if, I, if you're listening to this 
and you're thinking about going to seminary, you need to go to the master's seminary and you need to go onto the website now, today, and turn in your application and get that ball in play uh, because you need to redeem the time for the days are evil and teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And so we, 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 we must seize the moment now, today. So please do not be one of those procrastinators, one of those bench warmers, one of those spectators. Get out on the field and get in the starting lineup. And you, you've got to, to be trained first. And the Master's Seminary, if you feel the call of God upon your life to preach the Word of God, then there is no greater seminary on planet Earth than the Master's Seminary. It will give you the tools to be an expositor. And when I say an expositor, I, I don't mean hydroplaning over the text and being a communicator. I'm talking about being an exegetical, theological down in the text, preacher who preaches for decisions, who preaches for life commitment, who, who challenges people to follow Christ, who also is a minister of comfort and encouragement uh, to, to people going through this difficult time. There is no comfort like that which comes from being under the sound of the preaching of the Word of God. So, um, if you're thinking about going to seminary, now is the time, and you need to advance to the front lines now, while the while the battle is raging the most. I want to I want to go to seminary all over again. That was that was so inspirational. I want to go back to seminary, and, <laughs> and I'm there three days a week. So, <laughs> Doc, you, you couldn't you couldn't have served us better in this conversation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. One last, uh, you know, thing, uh, you know, you're legendary for your passionate preaching and your uh, just energizer kind of level approach to opportunity to preach. You're also well known for your fashion, which it seems like it hasn't, it hasn't laxed at all in the quarantine. Is that a Navy blazer in quarantine? Uh, Navy blazer. In a pocket with square? Yeah, with a pocket stay white button-down shirt. I, I took off my tie uh, that I slept in uh, just <laughs> so I could be more casual with you and, and not be intimidating or over the top. So th this is just kind of casual me. I just stepped out of the shower. Yeah. And, um, yeah, navy blazer, gray pants, white shirt. It's just... Do you, find, do you find that wearing the navy blazer around the house just commands more, you know, respect and more it, it, it you know, does privileges it, it improved our marriage immensely uh yeah. my wife listens to me so much better when i have a <laughs> black term i i normally have one with a little crest right here on the pocket uh some famous golf course around the world um and th that has a little extra octane in the tank as well so well, I mean, it's it's remarkable, and and I just wanted to commend you and you know draw our, our viewers' attention to that. Uh, all right, sir. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, for your commitment to training men and your work at the seminary and your work broadly around the world. Uh, may God continue to bless your ministry there in Dallas and beyond. Uh, for more of of good material from Steve Lawson, you can go to One Passion. Uh, ministries. There's uh, so much uh, available material. His, his preaching ministry from decades of exposition is available there. You can obviously find uh, One Passion on all the social media platforms. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, we would invite you to uh, be only in great anticipation for more to come from the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching, which launches this fall, 2020, October 2020. And if you'd like to uh, be kept in touch uh, in the coming months. Uh, make sure you go to our website, MacArthurCenter.org, and give us your email address. You can subscribe to our YouTube page where you'll find more videos in the interim, uh, like this one uh, from Dr. Lawson, another from Dr. MacArthur, and more to come. Uh, you can find that uh, by subscribing to our YouTube page. Dr. Lawson, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for dressing up for us. Thank you for your... No, I've dressed down. 
I've dressed no, it, Dan for this. You interview. look great. You look great. And, that means and I just, from you, Austin, that means the world to me. Like it's what Calvin called the doctrine of accommodation. And I appreciate you accommodating to me <laughs> in my, uh, in my inferior sweater. So doc, always good to hear your voice and your from laugh. The, and from your the stronger passion. brother to the weaker brother. Yes. You know, you're, <laughs> you're too kind to me. Thank you. Well, you're at least a brother. <laughs> you're at least in the family. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>